It's a rare thing to be uh, greeted with a Finnish language when outside, outside Finland. But of course it's great when it happens. Uh, so I am Jarmo from uh, Helsinki, Finland. Let's see if I get my slides back up here. There we go. Oops. And uh, as a day job, I lead Forum Virium Helsinki, which is the uh, Helsinki-based innovation company owned by the city. We are sort of innovation arm of the city, and we have lots to do with open data. Uh, but I'm very passionate about international work, and the key tool for that is the European Network of Living Labs, which I hope will be changing its name into something like Expert Network of Living Labs pretty soon, because it's not the European network anymore, it's an international network of 345 organizations across the globe, which share the passion for user-driven innovation and doing things with the people in practice as part of their daily lives, developing solutions that way. But today I should be talking about global uh, app marketplace for cities, how to create a global app marketplace for cities. If I knew the answer, I'd be a millionaire probably already, but I'll scrape some ideas together which might give you some directions of how to go there. Uh, what does app marketplace mean, if you think of that first? First, there's lots of apps, otherwise there's no marketplace. And second, you can use them in that whichever context apps are meant for, no matter where you are. And currently both of these things are missing from city apps, and I want to talk with you a bit about why that is and what can we do about it. So why should we need an app marketplace? What would that mean in practice? And how could we do it? Or how are we doing it? And I start with a, with a why. Uh, I often say, so I say it again, that cities are like old married couples, they think that they are unique, they have their unique set of problems. Nobody else, else are the same. But if you go to marriage counseling, you'll be quite soon find out that, you know, that's not the case. All the couples have the same problems. Uh, all the cities also have the same challenges. So cities will really benefit from having compatible solutions which roam from one city to the other. However, cities are different, and it's good to recognize that. Uh, we are now here in the Smart City Expo. Uh, what you are going to see in the coming days have lots to do with the concept of a technology city. Here's Masdar from Dubai. It's a technology city. It's something which you, you take a greenfield area, you pour lots of money there, and you build a completely fantastically unique city which solves all the problems. And these pop up supported by construction capital all over the world. There are a couple of problems with the technology cities. First, they are scarce. I mean, there are not that many places where you can build such a thing. Second, I mean, it costs a lot to build such things, and yet there are no standards. Current technology cities are more or less standalones. They are cities which are her hermetic. They work with themselves but not with other cities, because we don't have standards for city solutions. And of course, much more than tech cities, we have cities which already are there. I mean, we need to retrofit the cities. Most cities are there, and nobody ever thought that they should be compatible in any way. In the analog days, you didn't have to care. Maybe the railroad would, would be nice if it was the same width from one city to the other, electric currency, the same voltage, but otherwise you could run cities quite in an isolation. And with the retrofit to city, the challenge is the legacy. There's lots of stuff which is there. It has been there for a long time. There are good, good reasons why you'd want to keep it, and the uh, rejection to change isn't the smallest of them. And all in all, it's a messy job to retrofit the cities to, to be compatible. And with the retrofit and legacy comes also the challenge of mindsets, which is that the digital world is all about 
I mean, if you think of the uh, mindset of digital domain or ICT, it's a mindset of change. That's the mindset of ICT. Kill what you kill your darlings. Whereas that's hardly a mindset anywhere else. I hope it's not the mindset of healthcare. And in some ways it should be, because when we bring the solutions from the digital domain to in interaction with sort of a real life situation, real cities, we could benefit from the mindset of change. But we have the legacy. Then third kind of cities are the chaos cities. And uh, we talk about urbanization, that the world becomes urbanized fast. And the biggest trend in, in urbanization isn't that somebody builds technology cities or existing uh, Western cities grow. The biggest trend is that people just move in. And actually, I do know that neighborhoods in Brazil, the favelas, or Kibera here, they are not chaoses. They work as communities. But from the city infrastructure point of view, they are chaos cities. You can't use technology methods, sort of a top-down vertical integration methods, in a place where you don't have the infrastructure. Challenge is there is no structure. Structure is built while they grow. And the thing which this, these places have, the thing which they have is people. So that's the asset you either have to make the change with that asset, or then you can't make it. You have to work with the people to change the cities. So the challenge, common challenge to all of these places then is the, uh, nevertheless the same, and that's the lack of interoperability. And why it matters? Well, if you think of the uh, big platforms of the internet which we use, here's eBay, and uh, here is Airbnb, which turns people's homes into a hotel chain. I mean, how much do they have? 34,000 cities, 192 countries currently. These all are based on the fact that in the internet you can scale from zero to infinity and beyond, to quote Toy Story here. Whereas in one city you can't. So developing something for a city of Barcelona is not that interesting for a developer. Or Helsinki, you know, half a million people, what's that? Or Finland, five, five million people, what's that? Small, minor Chinese city. So if we want to get really this ecosystem going and apps developed, we need to get the scale. And for that, we need interoperability. Because when we get interoperability, then we can use the power of the group to do things for us. Here's Wikipedia, if it was a book, it would be 1900 volumes, English only. It's more than double that if you take everything else. And which publishing house could have done it? The, uh, I mean, I, I, nothing comes to my mind, yet the people could do it. Communities can do things which are utterly impossible any other way. And that's a massive force if we can use it to change our cities and our governments. Because it's extra resources. It's something on top of the taxpayer's money, which you can do which you can work with. Distributed resource used through one platform to build something bigger. And people are willing to participate. This is patients like me. It's a commercial service from the USA, or actually global nowadays. It's a co community of sick people. People share their illnesses in patients like me because they get peer support, and they participate, and they can meet people who are in the same situation, no matter where they are. And they participate in also developing solutions for the conditions they have. If you can create a combination of motivation and ownership, you get participation. Uh, other reasons. I think the definition of a good service is changing. Good service, in good public service, especially in healthcare, well-being, used to be the same service for everybody. That's democratic. But it's not the case anymore, because the world is interactive. We can use different tools. Who does e-banking here? Do you think it's a good service? Most people. Who thinks it's a good service? 
All right, you are doing things which used to be done for you. But doing, you are doing it yourself. And you think it's good. And that's because you can customize the experience. You can do your banking whenever. So, also cities should understand that good service isn't necessarily the same service. It's the right service, the correct service. It's the exactly perfect service for you at that moment. And the only way to do that is to talk with the people and to let them to be part, part of the product. Because you can't monitor everybody. They have to be able to choose themselves. And last thing why is that openness brings you efficiency and innovations. This is the Helsinki region InfoShare open data platform. We manage for the Helsinki region 1,100 data sets. And what comes out of that are things we couldn't think of. Uh, first, efficiency. There's a document management system for the city of Helsinki, which is horrible. It's truly bad to use. Civil servants hate it. It was opened as open data a few months back, and here is the app developed by a private person who happened to work in the company which built the original horrendous uh, system, with which you can really easily use the document system of Helsinki. It cost zero euros for the city. There were quite a few worse attempts, but this is very good. And the city didn't have to invest in trying to fix their poor system. The market took care of it. Here's another example, which is Blind Square. Blind Square is an application for the blind people, 800 million blind people in the world. It turns the city information into audio. You can walk in the city and hear where you are and where you should go, proposals from your peers. And it uses two platforms, OpenStreetMaps and Foursquare Data, and then it taps into open data sources of the cities. It's open source, it's been translated to 18 languages. Once again, no city in the world has put any money in this, yet it works in 18 languages in quite a few cities and gives the blind people a better experience of the city, which is something the cities really like. Okay, now then, what, what can you do? And uh, I've spent quite a time with the, with the why, but that's, the, of course, the most important part. And I have one uh, case with which I'm going to tell you what we should do. And that's the City SDK, City Service Development Kit. Uh, it's a European network of living last project which we coordinate. And in that project we harmonize service interfaces of eight European cities so that when you build something good for Helsinki, it runs in Istanbul. And the domains are tourism, citizen feedback and transport. Uh, who knows what an SDK is? Some people, not everybody. I'll open it up a bit. SDK means a software development kit, and that's something which Apple gives you, if you're an Apple developer. And that's something which cities don't give you. Now, we turn this into a service development kit so that on top of the service interfaces, there are also processes, licenses, waste work. And we work in three areas, participation, citizen feedback. You see the interface where, there, which we retrofit to the cities so that you can build apps which citizens can use. You don't build the apps yourself, developers do it. But we take care of the interface. In mobility, led by the city of Amsterdam, we have uh, specialized in crowd data, data from the people in the move. How can you enrich the data which city or city already has? And the same idea there. We retrofit the city system. Something works in Amsterdam, it works in Istanbul. And last area, tourism. How can you provide the unified traveling experience for the people? They are each done in one city, and then they're replicated in other cities. And we are now in the replication phase, and most pilots are happening in most cities, so it's going, going really, really well. And developers love it. Why we do it is because it brings internet innovation model in the cities. Diversity, flexibility and scalability of services instead of top-down model. And then last, okay, what are the ingredients, couple of key ingredients which we need to make it happen? First, build the right team. Like all startups, you have to have the right team. In our case, we have the team from the cities from the participating cities on top of our own team. And this is, they have to be people who are bold, who can build bridges, 
who are not afraid to test things anew, ask questions. But that's very much connected to other things, which is find the change engines. Uh, here in the middle is Asta Maninen in the gray jacket. Does she look like an avant-garde person to you? But she is. She is the director of City of Helsinki Urban Facts, and she is the change maker who we have, who really makes things happening in the city. They might, he might, might not appear like a nerd, but she's a brave woman. And they are everywhere, you just have to find them. Third is the combination of endurance. You have to have a long-term vision with which you work, but it must be combined with the quick, agile things which build the vision and prove the value of the vision all the time. If you try to build everything at once, it won't happen. But you have the vision and you build it one corner at a time, and they build on top of each other, and you get it done. And this combination of long-term work, long-term vision, and short-term pilot, short-term real value projects is crucial for the success. Civil servants lose interest otherwise. Next, involve the developer scene, and that's not the ICT scene, it's a different field. Developer scene, they are, not, they are, they are in development like, like they are rock and rollers are in rock and roll. They do it because they love it. And ICT companies are not necessarily filled with developers. It's a different group. Game developers, people who love to code, because they are the ones to do the apps. And of course then, never lose the target, which is maximum interoperability. So work with other cities. That's what I want to close with. Work with other cities, build things together. Because you are not that different like old couples. Thank you.